All right, chapter 12, rolling torque and angular momentum, all right? Um, if you see a car, if, if you think about a car happening, all right, a uh, car is rolling on the road because of friction. Without friction, it won't be able to roll down the road because the wheel would just keep slipping if this were ice, it would just keep slipping and it would just burn out, basically, right? It just keep slipping, slipping, slipping. It's not going to go anywhere. But because there's a friction between the tire and the tires and the road, right? As the friction of tire presses against the road, the friction between the road and the tire actually pushes the car forward, okay? So... It's very important that friction, right, is a big part in objects rolling, especially without slipping, okay? The friction, believe it or not, is a static friction, right? Um, because if it's kinetic friction, that means it will be slipping or it'll be sliding, okay? So the friction caused by the tire on the road and road on the tire, right? They're basically the same friction in the opposite way, okay? So both friction, right, are static friction. Okay, and they do not remove energy, so there's no real work done on them, okay, and they do not, right, remove energy. Because it's static, it's not going anywhere relative to that contact point. And if you don't go anywhere, if there's no displacement, then there's no work done. Okay? So it's very important to understand that static friction between the tires and the road do not cause any work done by friction. All right? That means if it doesn't slip or slide, it's rolling without slipping. Okay? So we're going to look at something when it's rolling without slipping. So the contact point right here, okay, the contact point, if this thing were to roll, okay, we have two kinds of motion. First of all, Center of mass is moving translationally as so, and it also has rotational motion, okay? And let's say it rolls at certain theta, or change in theta. And then amount that it travels this way is actually same as this delta S, Right? So imagine like a spool of ribbon here, right? And then you're unraveling the ribbon, and how much the ribbon has unraveled is what you're thinking about. Okay? So this amount that, uh, that spool unravel or ribbon is unraveled from the spool is the arc length S, right? And that is the actually the same distance that center of mass travels horizontally okay translationally okay so this and this are the same okay delta s or the arc length s can be calculated by theta r Okay, so we could say that that is arc length Okay, 
okay? That is also the same amount of distance that the center of mass travels translationally, okay? Delta S is equal to delta X, okay? So, this right here, these two conditions, right, represents rolling without slipping. It has to have this condition true, right? The arc length must equal to delta x, okay? Arc length is how much the ribbon is unraveled. Delta x is how much the center of mass travels translationally. And if these two are equal to each other, that means it's rolling without slipping, okay? And we know already know that velocity of center of mass is equal to delta x over delta t. Right? And since delta x and s are equal to each other, it is delta theta r over delta t. Therefore, if we were to isolate the delta theta and factor out the r, because r is going to be constant, this right here is my omega. So when V sub CM is equal to omega R and A sub CM is equal to alpha R and when delta X is equal to right, theta R, then we have rolling without slipping. Okay? So this is very important. So this must hold true, right? And this must hold true. And obviously, so is this. Like, delta x is equal to, right? Theta r can also be true, okay? So, the 1 and 2, this equation 1 and equation 2, are the definition. equation, right, for rolling without slipping. Okay, so when you see these conditions happen, that's pretty much representing rolling without slipping okay all right so let's analyze this more uh, deeply how this thing works since we have two kinds of motion happening simultaneously we have translational motion of center of mass and rotational motion in a circular form, right? When these two motions are happening simultaneously, we have rolling. Okay? Therefore, imagine the rotational motion, the spinning part. If I take a look at the top of the wheel, right? This top of the wheel is rotating in this clockwise fashion so it is moving um, tangentially at that location in a positive x direction at the bottom of the wheel the contact point or is actually the tangential velocity is in the negative x direction so these two velocities are happening at top and the bottom respectively as this thing is rotating 
Now let's, this is rotational motion. Now let's take a look at translational motion. Translational motion is when the wheel is going just horizontally without rolling at all, right? So the top, middle, bottom, they all will be traveling at same speed horizontally. When I combine these two, when I combine these two, ro rotational and translational, now we have rolling. So if I add these velocity vectors, for example, the top velocity vector, I get twice as much velocity at the top. The center, there's no translational velocity at the center while this thing is rotating or there's no velocity, linear velocity at, right? Because since V is equal to omega R and R is zero, so there's no V at the center. However, for translationally, I have V, right? So this is V, right? Negative V, right? V is equal to zero. This is V, V, and V, right? So when I add these up, at the bottom, they cancel out to be zero. At the center, it just becomes V. And here, it becomes 2V. Okay? So V sub CM is equal to V. V at top is 2V. Here, my V at the bottom is equal to zero. Okay? So V bottom, zero. V center of mass, V. V top, 2V. Okay? So two ways to achieve rolling without slipping. So this is very important, by the way. Okay? How do we achieve this rolling without slipping? Well, there are two ways to get this thing happening. You can have... Um, gear, right, attached to a wheel, right, and then if you rotate the gear using like a chain or something, then you are rotating the wheel as this gear rotates, right, then we have rolling without slipping. Another way would be if I were to hold the axle Right? So attach, like, you know, something to this axle and push onto this axle, then this will roll without slipping. Okay? So this push translates the wheel static friction at the ground right here, right? And lets the wheel fall over itself, literally, right? At the pivot point right here, right? and then it rotates, okay? So think about this as the pivot point, okay? This friction at the contact point, right, allows wheel to spin, okay? Creating, um, If there's no friction, it would actually just slide across, okay? So friction is very, very important to make this thing roll, okay? So without friction, Okay. In this case, in this case, think about like a bicycle or a motorcycle, right? 
if there's no friction at the contact point of the wheel, right, it will just spin out, right? It will just spin, slip, right? So friction here again, right, keeps the wheel, right, from slipping, right? And it has to be a static friction, because if it's a kinetic friction, then it will slip as it goes, like it will skid along, right? So it is the static friction between the road and the wheel that will keep it from slipping. Okay? Very important. So static friction is very important. All right. So let's do some analysis with some other things that we learned, other components that we learned earlier. Okay, let's take a look at some example problems. Okay. All right, uniform disk. Okay, like a rolling pin or, or solid disc, like a hockey puck, right? Instead of on flat ice, laying, instead of laying flat, it's like rolling, hockey puck rolling, okay? The moment of inertia is equal to one half mR squared. So, given the coefficient of static friction as... Um, mu sub s, okay, calculate the maximum acceleration and maximum f push for wheel to roll without slipping, okay? So let's do some analysis here. Well, first of all, let's do a force diagram. We know this is the force push on the axle, okay? And what other forces are there? Well, if we were to consider, okay, this here as our pivot point, okay, well, let's take a look. Here's the normal force. F normal is from the contact point, right? Straight up. Okay. The radius is actually you know, from here to here, straight down. This is R. We have FG, right? I'm going to put the FG slightly to the side. And we have some very important one, which is friction. I guess I'm going to draw slightly above horizontal line so you can see it. So here's my friction. Like so. Again, this is static friction, right? In order for this thing to roll without slipping, these two conditions must hold. Okay? So this is something that we need to have this ingrained in our brain, right? that these two equations must hold in order for, okay. And of course, we could also say, you know, 
x sub cm is equal to, right, um, theta r, right? So, sum of all forces is equal to ma. Now, this, of course, is Newton's second law of translational motion, right? The vertical in the y direction, we know f normal has to equal to fg. Right? But there's, there are no other vertical forces. Here, in the horizontal forces, I have F push. I'm going to consider that positive direction. And I'm going to consider F friction negative direction. So sum of all forces equal to MA. And sum of all forces also equal to. Uh, I'm looking at just X direction now. Is equal to F push. minus F friction. Therefore, if we set these two equal to each other, right, MA is equal to F push minus mu times F normal. Right? Which in our case it's just mg. Okay? So if I bring this to the other side, my F push is equal to right, ma plus mu mg. Okay? Well, Let's just leave it at that for now. Let's take a look at the torque side. You know, sum of all torque is equal to I alpha. And sum of all torque is equal to right, R cross F. Well, what's the only force that's causing this to rotate? Here is my pivot point. F push is acting right along the pivot point. So there's no radius, right? So there's no torque caused by this because R cross F will give me zero for my R is equal to zero for my F push. Well, what about F normal? and FG. Well, FG is acting along the radius. So the sine of the angle 0 degrees is equal to 0. So FG is not doing any torque. F normal also is acting in parallel with my radius. And that is also 0 because sine of 180 is also 0. Now, if I look at this, R cross F friction is the only one that's going to be causing this to rotate because R and friction is working out to be sine of 90 degrees, which is 1. Right? And it looks like R cross F is in negative direction into the page. Okay? So it looks like R cross F friction is the only torque that I have pretty much causing this to rotate. Okay. Now since alpha and torque are in the same direction, which is negative Z hat, and so is this is also negative Z hat, right? The negative Z hats will cancel out. Therefore, we can say, right? I alpha is equal to, okay, R times F friction times sine of 90, right? Sine of 90, and then negative Z hat, and this is also negative Z hat, and we're going to cancel those negative Z hats out, okay? 
I, which is one half M R squared, alpha is equal to A over R, right? Is equal to R times friction is mu mg and sine of 90 is 1. So, a lot of things will cancel here, huh? So here's one of the R's will cancel with this. And this R will cancel with this. Masses will cancel out. So it looks like we only have one half a is equal to mu g. So my acceleration comes out to two mu g. Now I can substitute this a into here. Then, my F max, this F push can be my F max. The maximum amount of force that I can apply is, right, M times, right, 2 times mu G plus M times mu G, right? I know it's... Right? So you can see the maximum amount of force that I can apply to this to make it roll without slipping is only three times mu mg. And this is my A max, right? Right here, this is A max. If it accelerates any more than that, it's, it's going to start to skip. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, I mean, you could start either way. You could start with this first, you could start with this first. But sometimes, since we're in a rotation, I think it might be easier to start with this to figure out what the acceleration is. So start with, you know, Newton's second law of rotations first, and then use the translational motion to figure out the maximum torque. Right. I guess this is important, calculating the acceleration, linear acceleration using alpha. All right. All right, all right. Let's take a look at one more. All right, so uniform disc rolling without slipping again. Right. What is the acceleration of the wheel down the incline? All right. We're going to do this two different ways. One using energy consideration another we can use as forces and torques dynamics okay hopefully we'll get the exact same answer but you know i think we have enough time hold on let me just check something uh, yeah i think we can do it all right All right, so here we go. 
let's think about what's happening as far as force diagram is concerned. We may not be able to finish everything, but let's get at least started. So here we have obviously the mg coming straight down, right? That's the obvious force, right? So here is my fg, right? So that's my fg. And of course this fg can be broken up into its x and y components, right? So here is my FGY, right? And here's my FGX. And of course, this is the right angle right here. And this angle here is theta. Right? And FGX is equal to MG sine theta. And FG, of course, is MG, right? This is MG cosine theta, right? Then we have F normal, which is the opposite of my F perpendicular. So here's my F normal. And of course, there's F friction happening. Okay, I'm going to place it right at the edge above. Okay, but you know where, you know where this belongs. This friction start. It should start from right here, but you won't be able to see if I draw it like that. Okay? So it's very important to understand, again, static friction does not, okay, remove energy. Okay? This is static. Okay? This is very, very important. And static friction, right? does not remove energy. Okay? Very important. So, there's no work done by friction in this case. That means we can actually work with Total energy initial is equal to total energy final, okay? Since work done by friction is equal to zero, right? We can say total energy initial is equal to total energy final. Initially, right, I only have potential energy of this because it's starting from rest, right? So... I could write down, you know, potential energy initial plus the kinetic energy initial, right, is equal to potential energy final plus the kinetic energy final. But kinetic energy initial is zero. So we only have potential energy, right? And final potential energy is zero because when it's down here, we don't have any height. So this here is equal to just MGH. That is equal to, now the kinetic energy final, when this thing is down here, it has two kinds of kinetic energies. It has kinetic energy rotational as well as kinetic energy translational. Okay? So we have one half, right? I omega final squared plus one half MV final squared okay so here my mgh now is equal to one half times i which is one half mr squared right i guess omega final is V over R. Okay. 
because v is equal to omega r. So we can substitute that in here, which is v over r quantity squared, plus 1 half mv final squared. So this v is v final. So when you square this v over r quantity squared, you get vf squared over r squared. Okay? So maybe we should write one more step. Sorry about that. So I'm going to put these together and say this is one fourth m r squared times vf squared over r squared plus one half mvf squared. Therefore, if you can see, the r squares will cancel out nicely, right? And what else? Mass would cancel out very nicely. All the mass right here would cancel out, right? So what we have left is gh is equal to 1 fourth vf squared plus 1 half vf squared. Okay, so this VF is the center of mass is VF, okay? So if I bring this, add these together, right? It would be 3 fourth, right? So GH is equal to 3 fourth VF squared. And if I solve for VF squared, my VF squared is equal to 4 thirds gh okay therefore my v f square is equal to v i square plus 2 a delta s s here is actually right delta s is equal to H over sine theta, right? Because opposite over hypotenuse is equal to sine of theta. So delta S is equal to H over sine theta. So we can replace this with H over sine theta. And we can replace my VF squared with that. So here I have four thirds GH is equal to initial velocity is zero because plus two A times H over sine theta. Right? So notice what happens to the H. H will cancel out. So if I solve for acceleration, right, I get my acceleration now is equal to, right, well, this 2 comes here, this becomes 2 thirds, right, g sine theta as my acceleration. Okay. Um, I don't think we have time to do the dynamic way. We'll do that next time when we meet. But you could probably try this on your own if you think about it, right? Because if this is, if we make the pivot point right here at the center of the axle, right? You got your R, you got your torque, I mean, F friction, which will cause torque. Right? You also have mg sine theta going this way. Right? You have fg, f normal, right? So you should be able to um, work it out using sum of all forces equal to ma and sum of all torque is equal to i alpha. All right? So we should be able to work that out. We'll do that next time. So for today, I'll stop here. And we'll meet back on Friday at school. All right?